So, should I? Okay. Dear ladies and gentlemen, happy and prosperous new year to all. Dear Vice uh, President of Public Affairs, Karidi. Dear Dean of the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Maragou. Dear Mrs. Lekatsa. Dear colleagues, students and guests, on behalf of the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Department of Science and Mathematics, welcome. It's a great honor to have Professor Paximos here with us today to deliver a lecture on why psychology lost its soul. Professor Paxinos will claim that psychology lost its soul in the 1930s. This means that the concept of soul is not needed to either understand or modify behavior. Similarly, Christoph Koch, a German-American neuroscientist, best known for his work on the neural basis of consciousness, holds the view that our brain is the riverbed that holds and channels our stream of consciousness. Along the same line of uh, thought, Professor Paxinos will argue that consciousness is molded by family and culture. In addition, experience sculpts our character from the genetic material we are granted, as Phidias sculpted uh, Apollo from a block of parian marble. Alzheimer's disease will pay an unwelcome visit to many of us at the end of life. It will disrupt the internal structure of our neurons, and we will be leaving evidence the mind is the product of the brain and has no influence on it. Which one of us would not like to discard our depression, anxieties, obsessions, compulsions, or, un or our unrequited love? In the words of Samuel Benjamin Harris, an American philosopher, neuro neuroscientist and author, it seems the puppet is free only in as much as it loves its strings. Uh, Professor Paxinos will take us to a journey in the centers of our brain and mind and will speak on the neuroscience behind The River Divided, a novel in the environmental genre that broke a record in the time it took him to complete, and that is 21 years. He will speak of the neuroscience principles on the formation of heroes of the novel, giving a historical account on the origin of ideas of the mind, the soul, free will and consciousness. Aurelian, in its encapsulation of the quintessential moral and social dilemmas of the 21st century, a river divided, shows Professor Paxinos to be a storyteller. Cloned ancient genes skip 2,000 years to produce identical twins who are raised apart, unaware of the other's existence, but destined to clash in an almighty battle for the Amazon. We are all eager to explore the story together with Professor Paxinos, and at the end of his lectures, Four students will read passages from the book to be followed uh, by QA questions uh, in the session that follows. Uh, and from our panel of uh, professors, and then open the floor to uh, the audience. They can, the event can go up to 3.30, and students who have a class uh, should leave the hall quietly. Uh, Professor George Paxino studied at Berkeley, McGill, and Yale and was a visiting scientist at Cambridge, Oxford, Karolinska, Stanford, and UCLA. He's a Scientia Professor of Medical Sciences at Neuroscience Research Australia and the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He has identified and named more brain regions than anyone in history and has published 58 books. His first, The Rat Brain in Stereotaxic Coordinates, has been the third most cited scientific book of all time and his Atlas of the Human Brain has received awards from the Association of American Publishers and the British Medical Association. Recently, Professor Paxinos was included in the 63 scientists identified in the study 1821-2021 Greek Pioneers in Medicine and Biomedical Sciences by Aristia and the American College of Greece. Please join me to welcome Professor Paxinos to the podium. Thank you, Vivi. Um, I'd like to quote Mark Twain, uh, who uh, said, I always get embarrassed when they introduce me. They never say enough. <laughs> you should see his CV. It would take the whole hour if we were to present him properly. <laughs> uh, brain, brain and mind. Who is the puppet? In, who is the puppeteer? It's another question. Uh, to the another way of asking the question, uh, why psychology lost its soul, and uh, uh, and uh, here we go. Here is the 
puppet and here is the puppeteer. Who is the puppet, the brain or the mind? Uh, now, uh, Nidhi mentioned kindly that I've done atlases. This isn't always an advantage. Uh, once I was introduced to a lady at the neuroscience meeting, and uh, she had used my atlas 40 years ago, and uh, she said, George Paxinos, I thought you were dead. <laughs> and uh, 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 for those of you who are in psychology, I can claim something. I shook the hand that shook the hand that shook the hand of Wilhelm Wundt, the founder of psychology in Leipzig, 1879. So, we can wash our hands later, but anyone wants to uh, shake my hand, please do. Yeah, we started our work with uh, the rat, uh, and uh, it was a stereotactic uh, uh, atlas we produced, and for it I relied. Uh, I really had two thoughts in uh, my career uh, that could count uh, for something that actually made some change in what I was doing. Uh, one was to pick up on a stain of the brain that revealed the structure within as though it was colored in by someone. You didn't know. You didn't have to be a great neuroanatomist to find that there are differences between the various areas displayed here. In other words, the uh, this is fast moving. Uh, the area here, which is dark, you can see here, is clearly different from this one here, clearly different from that one there, clearly different from that one there. So you can draw the borders. You don't need to be uh, either clever or knowledgeable. Uh, and uh, I use this thing to uh, do an atlas of the mouse brain, which was really uh, the topic I was studying then, brain and behavior. And somebody argued back then, actually, at the same time, the gain in the brain is mainly in the stain. And uh, there's something else again. I don't always, I use acetylcholinesterase, by the way, that's what is the stain. For those of you who do biology, they break down enzyme of acetylcholine. I don't always stain the mouse brain, but when I do, I prefer acetylcholinesterase. Now, the rat is interesting, but really I was uh, developing an interest in, in the human as well, to do an atlas of the human brain. But before trying that, I thought of trying some primates where you can get the tissue in far better quality, short periods of postmortem, immediately after death, uh, and uh, uh, rather than the human, that you have to wait for something like 10 hours. Uh, before you uh, get the brain, they won't give to you earlier. And uh, uh, this you can see a marmoset, a small primate, the size of a small rat. And yet it has the brain of a primate. And, and I'll tell you about the similarities. And of course a primate looks like us externally. Guess what? Internally likewise. And uh, uh, this uh, is an Ravadan. I didn't study in Ravadan. I really want to study uh, a, a chimpanzee, and I sent a letter to the zoo in Sydney requesting the opportunity to do a postmortem on a chimpanzee brain once a chimpanzee died. They responded they would be happy to oblige, but they had not had the death of a chimpanzee in the zoo for a decade. Two months after receiving my letter, three chimpanzees died. Luckily, they didn't suspect me. And I uh, studied the brain of one of them, uh, and that led us to, uh, to do the atlas of the human brainstem. We look at the brainstem, we found no difference between the chimpanzee brainstem and the human brainstem that you see here that we published a couple of years ago. And. Uh, Oops, jumped a bit. There we go. Uh, now, here. Uh, now, of course, most people are interested in the cortex because 
higher cognitive functions that uh, psychologists are interested in uh, are best uh, uh, represented in the cortex. Basic functions, sexual behavior, thermoregulation, cardiovascular control, you could consider the hypothalamus brainstem, but most of the interest in the cortex. And there is a person who did the tremendous map of the human cortex, uh, not surpassed since 1924 when uh, von Economo and Koskinas uh, did uh, their amazing work. Yet their atlas was not listened to. And the Broadman Atlas, some of you might have come across, is used to study the human brain, the human cortex especially, an atlas far inferior to the Constantine von Economo Atlas. Uh, but in uh, non-human primates, uh, it has been used, and we are also used the concepts of von Economo uh, to identify the areas of the marmoset uh, cortex that you see here, the marmoset cortex. And if you look at these areas, and then you look at the human, when that has been done in some areas well, you find that actually the same areas are there also. It's not so for the rat, that is, the rat cortex is principally heterologous. It's not uh, uh, everywhere the same with the human cortex, but the marmoset seems to be that these primates have similar parts in the brain, including the cortex, where you would have thought to be some differentiation in the prefrontal cortex, for example, where some of the planning, organization, inhibitions that uh, uh, are subserved by that part of the cortex. Even in the areas of uh, speech, uh, such as Broca's area, where you have 44A uh, and 44B, uh, these were identified, you can see them here, even in the marmoset. And somebody objected to us once, uh, saying, well, don't you know these areas uh, are involved in speech? When did you last have a conversation with the marmoset? And uh, our answer was that if in a human we agree that there's an area 45A and 45B here and here, and this hemisphere doesn't speak, then we have the right to likewise find these areas in the marmoset that does not speak. If cytoarchitectonically, connectionally, myelarchitectonically uh, is uh, similar homologous areas. And uh, here you will see that we, of course, these maps have been done on histology. Oops, but we are uh, there. Is this going to work? It worked before. Oh, there we go. It's started. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you, these maps that I spoke to you up now have been histological maps. But now with the MRI, you can actually get. Uh, images and also uh, look at the connections through the uh, movement of water and uh, uh, the DTI. And uh, uh, we've done that in the rat. In the human, we haven't done it yet. We've done an atlas of the human. We tried to do something on the cortex. N not happy yet. Uh, and uh, now, of course, the imaging can assist us with that as well. And there are people who are doing very good work with imaging. Um, ours, uh, uh, and you can see here pathways are, that are colored, color coded according to the direction the fibers go, the connections go in the brain. This is the brain stem again. Uh, the blue is the corticospinal tract, the red is the pontine crossing fibers. Now, I'll show you now something that. Hopefully, it will come out in two years as an atlas of the living human brain. In other words, what you are seeing here are images from a person who is still around. It's actually my colleague in uh, constructing this atlas. And this is his brain. Uh, and uh, we are studying it. Uh, and you can see some of the connections uh, that have a certain color because of, uh, like the corpus callosum, 
because of uh, the uh, uh, mediolateral uh, direction of the fibers there. And uh, now, uh, brain or mind? Uh, 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 the question has social, legal, and religious implications. If the mind controls the brain, then there's free will and corollaries, dignity, responsibility. You are king in your skull sized kingdom. You are the architect of your destiny. If, on the other hand, the brain controls the mind, an essential conclusion follows. There's, there can be no free will, no praise, no retributive punishment, no purgatory. That's not so bad, of course, if purgatory is abolished. Uh, and little hope for survival. So, what are we? Are we just our brains? Does the mind have any agency? Can the mind make the brain do something? And uh, I'll, I mentioned some of the work I did, of course, and now uh, coming to some historical aspects of this question of the brain and mind, or why psychology lost its soul. And here we have uh, Iso. The fox entered the house of an actor and ravaging over everything. She pulled out a mask, a beautiful imitation of a human head. She put it, her paw on it, and said, What a beautiful head, yet it's without any value because it's entirely without a brain. And uh, uh, this uh, praise of uh, the brain you will see in other artists. Who would have thought of Woody Allen as an optimist? And yet, even he, when it comes to the brain, has something nice to say. He said, the brain is my second most favorite organ. <laughs> uh, to understand uh, that the brain has something to do with behavior is difficult. Uh, it doesn't move. Uh, if somebody kisses you like the heart does, rattles. Uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, ancient Egyptians uh, dis uh, heedlessly discarded the brain and sent millennia of pharaohs brainless to their afterlife. Some pre-Socratic philosophers rejected supernatural causes and mythical explanations of the physical world and the nature of the soul, including the relation between psychological events and the body and they replaced myth with reality, banishing gods and magic. Alcmeon of Croton is thought to be the first person to determine the connection between the brain and uh, behavior. And that information from Crotone, Croton, uh, in uh, Magna Grecia, uh, seemed to have passed on to Kos, where lived the most important uh, doctor of antiquity, and uh, Hippocrates presents an astounding modern view of the brain. Men ought to know that from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughters, and gestures, as well as our sorrows, pain, griefs, and tears. Unfortunately, Aristotle, who uh, is thought to be the greatest scientist of antiquity, uh, 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 didn't get this correctly and thought that the brain was there to cool the blood, air conditioning. <laughs> and uh, you know that uh, a professor's greatness is measured by the time he manages to stop progress in their field. And uh, people after him, of course, are responsible for this because they would defer to him and not do their own studies. Uh, and it, but however, there was opposition by uh, somebody from Pergamon, Bergma in present-day Turkey, and that was uh, Galen, and uh, he was an admirer of Hippocrates, and uh, uh, he, his view, encephalocentric of Galen and cardiocentric Aristotle, battled each other out for 1,300 years until after the dawn of modern science. And uh, Shakespeare in Portia, in the version of Venice, tell me, where is fancy bread? Or in the heart, fancy is love, of course, or in the heart or in the head. And uh, if you go today to pick up a card for your loved one, 
and this was a, what I was confronted with in Bondi Junction in Sydney, 300 cards on Valentine's Day, everyone with at least one red heart on them, none of them with a brain. And it forced me to write an article uh, in the newspaper. Uh, darling, I love you from the bottom of my brain. And uh, a journalist from uh, the Australian Broadcast Corporation called me. Are you insisting that the heart has nothing to do with love? I said, if in a heart transplant I get your heart, I am not going to fall in love with your husband. <laughs> she said, what a pity, and he's such a lovely man. <laughs> and uh, uh, if next time you want to uh, declare your love, I'll give you something to send that is not only pretty, but is also true. And after such a battle to localize the seat of the soul, Psychology loses its soul in 1930. No psychologist uses the soul, and it would be cruel if they did. If a, a child with uh, autism comes along and you say, oh yeah, it is your soul that's the problem. This, your soul is no good. I mean, that would be cruel. Uh, so now we're looking at the brain as an organ, and look at physiology and how things can improve rather than assign uh, blame that way. And uh, the mind is the integration of the activity of the brain. There's no ghost in the machine. And uh, uh, once giving a lecture like this one, I asked some people in the audience beforehand uh, the question, uh, do you have a soul? And the answer was always, pardon me? They couldn't believe that someone would ask them that. But one girl eventually said to me, I did until I did my PhD. <laughs> and this, so this soul is superfluous to requirements. Ipsychine peritia di psicologia. Now, uh, is there at least free will? I mean, do we have anything, any agency? Are we any, anything at all? Or are we just robots walking here? doing robotic jobs. And uh, uh, I asked the lady in uh, the place where I was having my coffee and writing my novel, uh, I said to her, do we have, because the novel uses these concepts of neuroscience, so I asked her, uh, do you have uh, uh, free will? And uh, she said, I do, but I don't think many out there do. Uh, and of course, there's this perception that, of course, well, I'll decide whether I have vanilla or uh, uh, chocolate ice cream. I mean, who else is going to say me? Uh, okay, uh, neuroscience has something different to say. And uh, they tell you, and Skinner, whom I had the uh, good fortune to meet, I invited him to give a talk at McGill when I was a student there, and he came. Uh, and uh, his, uh, the argument is, best expressed by Skinner, is that there are two and only two factors that are responsible for behavior. One is genetic endowment and the other is the environment that molds that genetic endowment. If you find a third factor, you could possibly have free will. Some argue that chance factors. Well, chance, of course, will not attribute to you free will. If it's by chance that you're doing something, it's not your, you don't show agency, you don't show that you are responsible for that. Uh, so if we accept that, then there can be uh, no freedom. And um, the environment sculpts character, just as this unknown artist, possibly Phidia, sculpted Apollo from Parian marble in this statue from the temple of Zeus in Olympia, just as Praxiteles sculpted Hermes. Neuroscience agree, genes confer predilections. And by the way, this is the majority view. Could, could be correct, it could be that the minority is right. But by far, this is what they will tell you, uh, uh, many consider the environment as the only sculptor of behavior. If only we could abandon our undesirable desires, our depression, our obsessions, our compulsions, our unrequited love. Alzheimer's disease 
will pay an unwelcome visit to many of us at the end of life, to actually half the people over 85. And it will disrupt the internal structure of our neurons, and we will be leaving evidence that the mind is the product of the brain and has no influence on it. If only we were the authors of our thoughts and not mere observers of what the brain presents us, if only the puppet could get hold of one of the strings with which the brain makes it dance, it seems the puppet is free only in as much as it loves its strings. Many neuroscientists believe that we were slaves of yesterday, but here some of you who are psychologists, here where things are not as bleak as it, they look, because Today is tomorrow's yesterday, and the brain can change. And today, the experience that you have will uh, produce some difference in your brain, and tomorrow it might make a different uh, decision than under the same circumstances it would, would have made today. Now, one place where you can indicate where, uh, that there is no freedom is love. Uh, L'amour jamais, jamais connu de loi, uh, Carmen says. And Voskopoulos uh, 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 says, Theem one thing so calom of God in Athena to me alone. So uh, there's no, I mean, why would God, be, God might be busy with other things? To ask him to get her out of your brain. Come on, you, you change your mind if you are free to choose. There's no freedom whatsoever. Now you might say, well, you know, this is really overdoing it, and this is also uh, not of use, practical use to psychology. Well, consider half the people, or over half, that are abandoned by their partner interfere with that partner. Uh, at uh, her home, at her work, in the internet, they may hit her, they may kill her, they may commit suicide. If only they came and listened to one of the neuroscientists speak, they would understand that much as they cannot jettison the love they have for her, she cannot make herself love him. A different approach to crime and punishment, of course, if there's no retributive justice, there's no hate. Uh, and uh, uh, remember Jesus on the cross on this. Uh, this man said something, this philosopher said something very important. Uh, forgive them, God, because they don't know what they're doing. In other words, if they only knew, they would be with us. So that is a modern neuroscience view. Uh, if the uh, brain is the puppeteer, therefore it's important to know if the brain is the right size. If the brain was smaller, less clever, and capable of language than what it is, it would not have been able to produce the uh, technology which today threatens existence. If the brain were larger than what it is, it might have understood the problem, even perhaps solved it. The conclusion is that the brain is just not the right size for me. And uh, uh, I was hoping that we might have, uh, uh, avoid the epitaph Intelligence made them extinct. And uh, here, uh, I think we have to avoid the triple delusion under which humanity operates. That we have a soul, that we have free will, and that we are made in the image and likeness of God. If ever, there was a hubris, and remember Sisyphus, he was hubristic, uh, this is it. And uh, look what happened here to Phaethon, who took charge of uh, the chariot of the sun, and he was not doing a good job, and Zeus uh, sent a thunderbolt. And uh, uh, if only we could arm ourselves with the truth that, at least according to some scientists, some neuroscientists, perhaps the majority, there is uh, that we 
Yeah, firstly, I would acknowledge E.O. Wilson, who just died, this great physiologist, uh, who said that, puzzled, we stand before nature. We don't know why we're here. Uh, we have paleolithic emotions. And if I could add some things there, uh, a brain that carries with it remnants of the reptilian period of crocodiles and that we do not have what we think we do, the free will and the soul and we are more akin to the chimpanzee than anything else rather than God and uh, if we understand that we have, we have the capacity to put an end to life here and uh, not only to us but to the other living creatures. We understand our place in evolution and uh, we set our stern to the dawn rather than uh, the grave of our children then we could make winds of our oars and uh, that these concerns about the brain what I saw in my trip through the brain and uh, uh, that made me start writing uh, The River Divided, a novel The River Vero Genre that uh, broke the record as Vivi uh, said uh, that neuroscience principles are used in the formation of characters such as those related to the mind, soul, free will and consciousness environmental issues are at the center of the novel, including the question of whether the brain is the right size for survival. Characters in the novel speak directly on the principles of neuroscience, for, for example, Professor Eastbrook, uh, or demonstrate these principles uh, uh, as, for example, when they never display uh, free will. That's the book. And I was motivated to write this after repeated defeats at the hand of government. And I used some of my, because I tried to establish a track transport in Sydney and other things and um, every time I was defeated and I thought maybe I'll write a novel and I might take the reader with me and change behavior upstream not try to stop someone from cutting a tree but make them want not to cut the tree and uh, some of the things in life was uh, formative for me I had a good friend who died from temporal glioma, glioma and uh, uh, I described the condition of one of uh, the heroes in the book and by uh, chance uh, a kindergarten teacher read the Greek version of the book some years ago, an early version of it that is, and she diagnosed her friend with temporal lobe glioma on the basis of the symptoms described in the book. So, uh, I, the, um, uh, I, I've tried to include uh, science as it should be included, not that it's watered down and misleading, and uh, the book starts in uh, Masada, in Israel, where a formidable discovery occurs, the outcome of which is the uh, uh, appearance of two identical twins. And there's Masada, uh, there's Jerusalem, uh, there's the crucifix in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and again there at the Golgotha, and uh, the representation of the anointing of the body of Christ, and this is the Holy Tomb, and uh, because you might have guessed, uh, if I were to, uh, the question is, what if, what if Christ were alive today? What would have he would have said about environmental damage? Would he have sided with the companies, or with the environmentalists? And there is the Wailing Wall, some of the places where this takes place, the novel takes place. And this is Rome. Uh, some scenes happen there in the Vatican here and uh, again Rome and this is the Amazon and you find that it's a river divided the Amazon Rio Salmois and Rio Negro and uh, the forest there and uh, Buenos Aires in the obelisk things occur in the Pyramide as well uh, Casa Rosada in the, the Cathedral of Buenos Aires, in the medical school where the siege occurs, the students 
are demanding that Argentina works with other nations to reduce uh, to, uh, through to reduce human reproduction to sustainable levels through social and medical interventions and they didn't fare well and, uh, and they are the, the church in San Telmo that you will see depicted in and then the University of New South Wales here I am with Cecilia Ferreira the first girlfriend of Che Guevara who allowed me to use the conversation that we had with each other and uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, Evelyn had found in the Judean desert an ossuary with what she believes are the remains of Christ. Amongst the bones was a well-preserved brain. We find her looking under the microscope at a stained section of that brain. She placed the tissue slide on the stage of her Olympus microscope and turned on the light that shone through a condenser onto the undersurface of the slide. She closed her eyes for a moment, knowing the evidence was already there. After a few seconds of tense immobility, she opened her eyes. The cells were shining bright blue and were arranged like stars in constellations. When she moved the stage of her microscope to different fields of view, she was an astronomer training a telescope of unexplored sky. The cells were beautiful and arranged as a work of art. She was the sole witness of a spectacular pyrotechnic show. Using her 40 times lens objective, she moved in on one neuron, a giant pyramidal cell, a bed cell, located in the fifth layer of the cortex. She could see the structure of the neuron, including its nucleus, when the genetic information was stored. It was a flower whose closed petals kept the secret of how to, a construct, how to construct a life. The stain was taken up, not only by the cell body, but also by the closest parts of the dendrites, tentacles that which neurons communicate, exchange protoplasmic kisses with an epic love journey. The cells looked as though it had been obtained from an on-the-spot biopsy during surgery, rather than a 2,000-year-old tissue. She, she zoomed in and looked at the distribution of the cells again. This was not just any brain. These were not just any cells. These were neurons responsible for a historic change in civilization. All the ideas came from here. All the courage was generated here. All the suffering was endured here. Bent over the microscope, Evelyn closed her eyes again and she recalled the discovery of the ossuary and the stigmata of the skeleton. She opened her eyes. Arranged in six neat layers were gigantic pyramidal cells, granule cells, spindle cells, stellate cells, chandelier cells. These are the gems of his mind. Now, Liliana Papadopoulou will continue with the second passage. Evelyn and Michael, given the expected pregnancy and the most unusual genetic endowment of the child, they want to find out how he might turn out. But which is stronger in the end, asked Evelyn, nature or nurture? Both genes and the environment are essential for all behavior. It's not nature versus nurture, but nature via nurture. Intelligence is the product of two factors the genetic endowment inherited from parents and the environmental influences on the endowment. The contribution of the two cannot be disambiguated. The professor had interlaced his fingers and was making as if to pull them apart while they refused to oblige. Nonetheless, given similar socio-economic backgrounds and schooling, we can assume IQ is principally determined by the genetic makeup and motivation, he quickly added. Motivation itself has a hereditary and an environmental component. 
Michael could see Evelyn was completely absorbed and what the professor was saying would hardly dissuade her from the course she had embarked on. The embryo she had construct constructed was progressing normally and the intended day of transfer was the following week to fit in with her natural cycle. Are there any other factors that influence behavior besides genes and environment, he asked. Nobody has come up with any other credible factor. The professor scratched the back of the rat, which by now had crawled out of his pocket and nestled in his lap. What is virtually never appreciated is that the environment has an influence on which genes are expressed, that is, which genes become active, active in brain neurons. I'd better stop here before you start mutating before my very eyes, he concluded with a smile. Evelyn returned the smile. I've heard behavioral neuroscientists don't leave a crack in the parade of genes and environment for free will to wringle in, but there is none at all, no freedom, no dignity. There is indeed no freedom and no dignity because individuals have no control of either their genetic makeup or the environmental, inf the environmental influences on them. The professor seemed to enjoy his theory, his words, words emerging through the smoke of his pipe. We are slaves to yesterday. Our brain will make decisions on the basis of our experiments, experiences up to today. But here is where psychologists can be of use. Today is the yesterday of tomorrow, and our experiences today can change our preferences tomorrow. Meanwhile, the rat had fearlessly moved from the professor's lap to the armrest of his chair, paws bunched together, back humped, long tail counterbalancing the weight of its head, whiskers sweeping rhythmically back and forth, as though responding to a melody only it could hear. Thank you, Eliana. <laughs> Next to them is Zero, uh, Tutsa Del Rio. We find Evelyn contemplating after being diagnosed with temporal lung glioma. Part of her body had turned against her, killing her from within, stealing her life and hopes. Of course, she had noticed herself aging her biology changing, her stamina declining. But she had plans that spanned the next five years, the next ten. She had responsibilities, grant obligations, employees, students. She had friends, she had family. She had Michael, she had her beautiful son. And beyond all this, she still had to find her missing child. Three months would not be close enough, uh, sorry, three months would not be enough to see Christopher graduate. It would not be enough to see him find true love. Three months would not be enough for the things she had hoped to watch him grow into himself, to realize the potential that was inside him. All her dreams of witnessing his life events were suddenly disappearing. And there was no time for another trip to Argentina. Three months, and what three months lay before her. Three months that would rob her of her independence, her dignity, her mind. How much more humane if she were condemned to die by firing squad. Christopher is reading the thoughts of his José de Olmos. He does not know him, but the Olmos is his identical twin. Is the brain the right size? Puzzled, we stand before nature, surprised by our own existence, dazzled by our space-age technology and unaware of our Stone Age emotions. The task of creating a sustainable society may prove elusive due to the large-scale behavioral modifications requ required and the limited intellectual, motivational, and emotional capacities of our brains. Despite the apparently large morphological and behavioral gulf between the humans and the great apes, analysis of the DNA shows the humans to be more closely related to the chimpanzees than the chimpanzees to the gorillas. It is so proximal you can have a blood transfusion from a chimpanzee if you are the right, right blood group. Anatomically, the human brain should be considered a branch of an evolutionary tree of brains, a tree that also features the brains of the fish, the reptiles, and the birds. This de Olmos is presenting himself as a philosopher and environmental warrior, thought Christopher. No doubt he will see me as just another suit. A marginal structural superiority is the rationale for the human hubris. Never since Narcissus fell in love with the reflection of his face in a river has there been such adoration of a bodily organ as there is now of the brain, and never with less justification. Without considering the severe limitations which evolution has placed on the brain, we dare to play God with the earth. In an insane effort to countermand global warming, we are contemplating geoengineering to dim the sun so that we can burn even more fossil fuels. 
This is the coup de grâce to the dying humanity. At least that almost is original, Christopher thought. Nobody else has attacked the brain. But how do you, how do you negotiate with someone like that? The title of the next chapter read, Is the only sustainable society one of hunter-gatherers without fire? What does the almost want? To give up fire? To return to pre-Promethean times? His ideas do not come from any textbook in economics. From what Christopher had read, it was not clear what academic discipline the almost was following. His thinking was an amalgam of ethics, neuroscience, ecology, and theology. I have to hand it to the guy. He was a coherent rationale, convoluted though it is. My own position is not as pure, but it doesn't require sacrificing everything. Hydroelect hydroelectric dams deliver major community benefits. And what could be more environmentally friendly? Maybe this the almost knows something I don't. One thing is certain. One of us is deluded. I would like to thank uh, our students uh, who did a wonderful uh, job with the passages. And uh, maybe now turn to our faculty and uh, perhaps uh, stand with them. Dr. Baderaki, and so Dr. Baderaki, would you like to ask a question to Professor Maximus? Uh, I can say I have read the book, Re uh, River Divided, over Christmas. It's highly recommended. It's thoughtful, timely, interesting. Uh, it touches so many uh, 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 main questions, uh, nature versus nature, environment, uh, where are we going, technology. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, it was, uh, I read it in, uh, in three days, in three nights. Um, I have um, I have many questions. Allow me to live in, in the illusion that I use my free will now. Have chosen my questions. <laughs> um, I would like um, my first question is uh, given your extensive experience in the field of um, neuroanatomy. What are your thoughts regarding the how the brain, the muscle change, the cells generates forces? Right, this is the one question that has been plaguing philosophers and neuroscientists of recent uh, and of course consciousness uh, is something that has not been defined to the satisfaction of uh, the others and, uh, but we do know something, something is known about consciousness uh, is that uh, we have more of it while we're right here uh, and awake less of it when we're falling asleep, uh, very little when we're embryos, uh, diminished progressively in dementia. So uh, we know something about this, and we know something else, that consciousness is just not the property only of humans. The great apes have as well, and actually uh, all mammals, and maybe all vertebrates, uh, uh, and uh, uh, octopus, likely as well, uh, and it can go down on the phylogenetic scale, but in terms of the uh, high level of, uh, you know, what is it, the high conscious, high level of consciousness that we have, uh, degrees, and what accounts for it, presumably a lot of uh, well-working neurons, that is, you can have a few neurons and you can have a stimulus response action in the aplysia, in the sea slug, there is, uh, nobody argues that there's consciousness, consciousness there, but then if you have more neurons, uh, more complexity that is, more and more, all of a sudden you can fall in love, uh, which is a sort of different thing than uh, the firing of the neuron. Uh, uh, and it, the quality, as the philosophers have been calling it, calling it and, uh, Yet no neuroscientist has given a good answer that I know of uh, to uh, this, other than it has to be in the brain. I think neuroscience by large consider that consciousness is the product of the brain, a material thing. And uh, the, the problem I faced when I was giving a similar talk to the High Court and Supreme Court Justice in Australia is that one of them said to me, oh, you're giving us mind. Actually, she said it even nicer. She said, what happens to the mind 
when the brain dies. Because obviously, I was not using the word soul, uh, but I was using the word mind. Uh, and uh, she, her, her point was, uh, are you really substituting things? Uh, and the, the answer that a neuroscience will give you to that is that if consciousness is the conglomerate of things, like uh, being conscious in, of the color on uh, my uh, left uh, uh, low, uh, lower quadrant of my visual field, and I have uh, uh, suffered a, a lesion in the corresponding part that's connected in the right side of the brain, then I will lose the color, uh, conscious of color. If I suffer uh, damage to the right parietal lobe, I have contralateral sensory neglect of the left side, and I will not see food placed on the left side of my plate. And, and continually like that, uh, with the frontal lobe, you will uh, lose capacity to plan for the future, to uh, inhibit your actions that are inappropriate for the place you find yourself. So, and if my brain is rotting in the funerary casket, I don't think my mind will be floating away somewhere, because for sure, uh, parts of it are gone already, well before I die. So, Neurons are responsible for it, but nobody has given a good explanation of what exactly is happening there, that the neural activity transforms into the perception of pain, of love, hate. And uh, one, uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the next great, uh, the next great, uh, great leap in uh, neuroscience, in the next, in the future? Yeah, uh, somebody said, uh, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And, uh, <laughs> but it seems to be heading toward more and more imaging. Uh, so, though it's often uh, expected too much of the imaging, far more than what actually delivers, in the sense that uh, I, I get writers, since I started writing, say to me that I give a course and I change the brains of my students and I want to see how they became, become creative and to find that in the brain. I said, that's very easy. You give them a, a task to write for you before they, the first thing that they come into your class and after they finish your class and they, you can see whether they're better or not by their writing. To try to find out this in the brain through imaging just uh, 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 too far, too much to expect. It'll have to be changes in the brain, but there are a huge number of changes, and it's just hard to control. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Paterakhi, and uh, uh, I would like to ask now Dr. Apostolaki if uh, she could uh, address a question to you. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you as well for this great speech and for opening a whole new world uh, in front of us. Uh, if you allow me, I will start by answering, by providing an answer to one question that you posed. Uh, I believe that if Jesus was alive today, he would have been with environmentalists and not with the companies. I'm certain about that. <laughs> uh, it was very interesting to hear that you said at some point, I think Vivi said that, that uh, the big loss of the soul and loss of mind occurred in the 1930s. Uh, this is a, a, a time in history that coincides with the big start of environmental degradation. We take as a reference year for climate change and environmental degradation 1880, which is the start of, of uh, industrial revolution, but a very big environmental impact due to human activities coming the decade between 1920 and 1930. So to me, this is a, there is a clear correlation between uh, the impact on the environment and us losing our souls, our mind. There are a lot of interpretations into that. So given that, if we assume that, given that, uh, and provided the very big global environmental problems, a huge environmental degradation. Uh, how do you think human brain is going to evolve in the future? Is it going to become to develop more complex neurons? Uh, 
Is it going to become larger in order to respond to these problems or is it going to become sick as our environment is? Yes, Stella, uh, yeah, it's nice to have an environmentalist here <laughs> because I spent a lot of time trying to figure out some things uh, and, and write something that deals with the environment. Uh, yeah, the brain, the uh, best assumption where the brain is going to end up in the next few thousand years, because it does take time to uh, things to uh, have a genetic filter, is who is reproducing today. If the uh, clever people are reproducing more, then future generation will be clever, whatever that might be representing the brain, bigger, more efficient synapses, whatever that might be, a lower, a higher pH in the milieu, whoever it, whoever it is, nobody knows what it is, but whatever it is, there will be more of it if the uh, people who uh, are more intelligent today are the ones who are reproducing. If, conversely, the people who are not as intelligent today are the ones that are reproducing more, then the brain, commensurably, will be less capable in the future which might not be a bad idea. We, the monkeys are not threatening their existence. Right, thank you, Stella. And thank you. Uh, Professor Paxinos, now I would like uh, to ask uh, Professor Vangos. Okay, thank you, Vidi. Uh, Professor Paxinos, it was a very interesting uh, lecture, uh, lecture in philosophy, not psychology or biology, so thank you very much. Uh, well, I will ask a question from the point of view of a biologist. So, we are living uh, the era of uh, digital revolution, so our children go up in front of a screen. Uh, uh, this has to do with their education, but mostly this has to do with their pleasure, so they spend a whole day in front of a screen. Uh, I see young people, they go out and instead of communicating with themselves, they're just in front of the screens or the mobile phones. So the question I want to ask is, how does this behavior, this, this way of growing up, uh, affect the development of the brain and will maybe affect the evolution of the brain in the future? Uh, yeah, maybe they're connected to ones who will have uh, a more uh, sexual contacts too and they will be next generation like them. That's only going to be through that filter, uh, who reproduces really. But how it will affect uh, the brain currently, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there are studies done by psychologists and they talk about it. They, we have far, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, who would be able to, to comment on this? I haven't followed the literature. The brain, of course, is capable to, up to a point of uh, overcoming some obstacles that come along the way. I mean, the chaps was telling us uh, about uh, uh, sex uh, being taboo and producing all sorts of uh, uh, prohibitions. I mean, the Catholic Church is obsessed by sex. I mean, if you look at them, Sex is the main menu thing there. You know, how you do sex and uh, uh, whether you have to be celibate and not have sex and you must not have it for fun and all that stuff. But that hasn't inhibited the instinct. I think uh, there will be enough hardy individuals to cope with uh, the uh, problems uh, that are produced by uh, the extensive exposure on the screen. They might be less fit for social interactions but this, I don't know. There will be people from the Iran so they do a company that would do look at the studies. Okay. okay. Thank you. Professor Paxinos, thank you so much. And I think I would like to ask you a question myself. So, can quantum mechanics and neuroscience be merged one day toward the, the theory that has, uh, is related to quantum consciousness? In other words, do you think quantum effects? play any role in brain activity. And I'm, I'm asking this because there may be a, a slight degree of freedom after all, or that there may be a deeper reality that uh, we have not yet fully realized, like that of uh, David Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know the scientist, but uh, the, the, indeed, uh, the science uh, does some things well. They can get you from here to Australia without dropping you into the Indian Ocean. 
do some things well, but with this, they haven't. And there are many things that uh, they can't answer, and, 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 yeah, and that is uh, why uh, yeah, it, it's not known as whether quantum mechanics, I don't know enough about that either, to, to comment about uh, quantum mechanics, whether it will come within your science somehow and present uh, uh, views. I mean, things are improving, and, and neuroscience has gotten some bite of that concept, problem of uh, conscious, in, in the sense how at least they showed it, that it exists in, in lower forms and that. So, uh, so I'm arguing, for example, that artificial intelligence can never become conscious, mainly because there will be a lack of deep understanding and problem with computation. So, like I said, there may be a little bit of hope that uh, perhaps uh, psychology has not lost its soul after all, or maybe we humans. Well, I mean, that was an important thing that you said there about the artificial intelligence that it will not be feeling well. I haven't, to, to, to support your point, I still have to see a Macintosh computer fall in love with an IBM computer. Not even with another Mac. As complex as these things you might make, I just don't have the feeling that they are going to fall in love. That's what actually uh, Penrose uh, said that, uh, you know, a few months ago. He said uh, he has this deep feeling that there will not be any deep understanding any, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence machine. Yeah, but then that leaves us with a problem. Yes, because, I mean, there. you know, exactly. because we don't, uh, we haven't found uh, divine intervention anywhere when we're studying the cells and dementia, and no matter how much you pray, it has no influence. I mean, if you want to feel good to pray, that's fine. Go and lock yourself up in a room and pray. That's fine for you. But as it concerns the outcome on someone else, well, unless you tell them that I'm praying for you and you feel better, that's fine. <laughs> but, but in terms of curing cancer through prayer, I would trust the surgeon far better. Uh, and so, uh, yet there's no evidence of divine things, and yet we cannot explain that it seems unexplainable that how these things, which are physics, chemistry, uh, connections, all physical, and yet uh, you sense the color of the rainbow and feel good. We are, uh, my grandchild hugs me and I feel happy. Uh, where is that? How does that occur? We don't know. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we don't want to take perhaps a lot of time, but maybe turn to the audience for some questions if you have. We can, we can stay here until 3.30 if we have time. Uh, yeah. So if uh, we have some questions from the audience, please. Yes. So, when I read the book, I was a bit angry. <laughs> How come uh, the, the child that Evelyn took care of grew up to a capitalist because she's a scientist and she, let's say, uh, perceives development, the concept of development differently than a capitalist. So, now that you explain why there's a division in the river, I'm happy that I got the answer, but I was really angry how the, the boy that Evelyn took care of grew up, what kind of mind he had. Still, I'm very happy that in the end, um, because of what happened to his twin brother, Jose, he, there is room for change and hope, so he becomes the other part of the, let's say, if he gives the DNA of Jesus Christ. <laughs> If, 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 if. For Evelyn it was, but for someone else. No one knows, no one knows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that's right. So, uh, that was a comment, is that right? A comment? Yes, that was just a comment. Yeah, thank you for the comment. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, please, back there. Yeah, I had a question.
questions. You practically, with what you said, you you propose that the, the mind has no control over the brain. However, I think it's Eric Kandel who has been advocating for years that even though we're not sure of how it's happening, through psychotherapy itself, we can see differences in the neural let's say, kind of level through psychoanalysis. With what you said, practically, you, I think it's gonna, you're reducing psychotherapy to just an influence from the environment, which is not true. The mind has the power to change the mind, has the power to change neurophysical uh, development. And the thing is, we're not talking about, you, you referenced Alzheimer's, which we know it has to do with holonergic kind of reaction, or it is a degenerative disease, it's a way different thing from mental disorders. I think mental disorders show that, and the fact that we have so many medications that do not completely treat those disorders, prove that the mind, the conscious mind, has some control over the neurophysical developments and processes. I was wondering whether, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. Well, firstly, you understood well what I was saying, that the mind has no agency, no uh, control over the brain. The mind uh, is a cork floating on the waves of the brain being dopamine or adrenaline or whatever else. Now, the environment can influence the brain. That is, any input, if you tell me now that a loved one died, I'll be depressed or very sad. Uh, so, of course, the environment, any information that comes could alter my brain and make uh, less production of adrenaline, for example, that makes you um, feel better. I inhibit that, that information. And psychotherapy, any information can uh, affect the brain. That's how it's going to exert its effect. Now, the, the mind itself, if it were to have an agency, why doesn't uh, I don't know if you've heard that uh, uh, experience of, you've heard people who say that I want to forget this person that I cannot. Uh, well, if somehow it, the observer, which is really the narrator, the mind tells us really, uh, uh, the brain tells us, has made a decision, tells us, if you're lucky to ask, is the narrator. Uh, and we think that we made that decision, but the brain has already decided in, uh, according to neuroscientists, to in uh, neurologic darkness. Uh, and the subconscious, in other words, of Freud back then has come again into vogue in this new form uh, of uh, the brain making the decision. Uh, that is, if you're saying that, well, uh, uh, the mind can decide, if the mind could be the narrator, you should be able to change your preferences. For example, that would be a good evidence that the mind can affect the brain. Theoretically, the mind cannot affect the brain because it will violate the principles of conservation of energy. Uh, because the, brain, the mind cannot, uh, without spending energy, make a neuron fire over here, suppress the neural activity over there. Uh, it cannot do that. Uh, so you have that problem to deal as well. Uh, but, but the principal thing is the Alzheimer's that you mentioned earlier, that, that uh, the Alzheimer's patient would like to have the memory, would like not to be disoriented in space and in time, and they would like to know that this is their child and not their father as they perceive them. My grandmother thought that her, my father was her father. And so if, uh, so, but they cannot do it. They, they, that is, we are, what we are is our brain. And if we cut any piece of that, the remaining brain uh, will be just an impaired brain. 
a commensurately impaired the consciousness, if you like, or the mind to the damage that the brain itself sustained. So, uh, in a way, you can uh, dismiss the, the mind if it's it just a slave to the brain. The mind has no agency, according to the neuroscience. Some argue that it does, but I'd like to know some examples of that. I think that when I, I think that the term mind has changed. I mean, it's not only about the consciousness. I think that even in psychology, the term my mind includes the unconscious as well. So if I say I'm in love with someone and I cannot forget him and I wish God would make me forget him, some could argue that the fact that I cannot get myself over that is because that satisfies some needs I have. For example, uh, the need to feel abandoned if you have some abandonment, abandonment issues. So it's, it's, I don't mean the mind, the conscious yeah. mind that says, yeah. um, you, yeah. I mean the whole concept of what psychological needs yeah. actually are yeah. being satisfied. You have expressed it very well. Uh, I'm impressed with you, but may I say that cannot be so, because uh, as follows. This person that you're saying is obtaining a need by still relying on that love that's all gone, yet they will commit suicide. What does that mean? I mean, why would they commit suicide? They would first commit suicide, then abandon that need. Then, then he, the matter gets too convoluted. That is, just consider uh, this, this need. Well, the best way to view that, I think, is as follows. That the brain is the Kinovulio, the Greek parliament, that you have some views here, some there, and they are fighting. It's civil war inside your head. And in the case of uh, love, you have the hypothalamus that wants to make love to that person, and only that. And nobody has his mind. Nobody has his mind. And you are just enchanted. And also, you might have the experience of them. Be pleasurable with that person, and the conscious says, you, He abandoned me, he doesn't want me. Let me get an hooked out of this person, and they are fighting. That's a better explanation than the one you're giving me, I think. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, one more uh, question, please. Uh, yes, uh, hello, uh, from all the other questions I have. A million more questions I want to ask, but it will take a long time, so I will ask my original one. Um, I have understood that in the brain, the neurons, the way that they communicate, I mean, from the glass, that there's an electrical signal, and it becomes chemical, and that's how they communicate with each other. But I have not understood is where is the information on that, the actual information, and the same is for the cables that we see, where is the information? Does our brain have like a, the electric signal is just the voltage that changes it? That's how the other neuron translates that into information. Okay. Well, I think, yeah, you're talking about specific energies of Mueller, Johannes Mueller, I think. Is that right? That is, you know, there was the, yeah, the wires and the external organs communicate, and if they are wired with the auditory system from the uh, visual system, then you will not see outside, but you will hear noises. So, yeah, but again, what constitutes the feeling of red uh, or uh, the perception of a tune, uh, yeah, that's the consciousness of it, it's the big problem. Yeah, that's right. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. So we don't know. I said, I said, so we just know that it's an electrical signal that becomes chemical. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, we, that's right. That, but we know that if there are certain areas of the brain that, if stimulated, perceive color, uh, or either color, or light, or others who perceive other things, touch. Movement. Yeah, uh, but how that uh, is, is perceived, how is, is changed to 
perception, the sensation, the perception. Yeah. But I had asked an electrician about it, <laughs> and he told me that probably it's, it's like something like a, a, a computer language, but it's like the voltage in the electrical signal changes, like Morse or something. That's what he guessed. But and in other words, it's hard to prove anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's one more question there. Uh, just a few more minutes and we... Yes, a, a very last uh, comment as a follow-up to this very interesting dialogue about brain, mind and psychotherapy. So, according to your metaphor, um, if uh, what is the relationship between the brain and the psychotherapy or psychotherapist? If, if um, if I understood well, then during psychotherapy, the consulate, the parliament in the brain between the different reg regions and activities are in, in a dialogue with the psychotherapist. So the psychotherapist is someone who comes to um, help the parliament to make up some decisions or um, come up with a better collaboration between the parliament members, something like that, because I find I found this very interesting, the metaphor, very interesting. Yeah. Would that be your um, yeah, perception you, of that? You stated uh, uh, very well. Uh, okay. Are we all, all, all adults here? Uh, okay, then I'll, I'll okay. tell you of uh, cognitive uh, uh, um, psychology on how to deal with relationships, because it, it has connection with this how this mm -hmm. thing change. Uh, well, uh, behavior and you, you can change the person by just talking. Uh, you're not rewiring the woman there and stimulating particular parts of, of the brain with the electrode, but just the same. You're stimulating certain parts of the brain. You're going through logical arguments. We are not going to leave this room the same. Neither you nor me. Our brain will be different. Uh, but uh, there was, I don't know about behavioral modification, and uh, this was uh, uh, our cognitive. Uh, you were saying in behavioral therapy. But I had a friend who was got his PhD on that. And I asked him, well, how does it work? And he said, well, look, they come to you and you solve the issue cognitively. Well, I want a concrete example. And he said, well, look, it was this couple and the wife did something. She went out with another man. And I brought them into the office. And I said to them, aren't you the same people? Don't you have the same children? Don't you have the same friends? Don't you speak the same language? Don't you have the same history? Don't you have the same house? Forget it, just move on. Forget it. And I said, well, what did he say? Uh, he said, you shouldn't have done it. You shouldn't have done it. And I said, and what did she say? Uh, yes, but he didn't go deep. OK. <laughs> Yeah, right. But in terms of, I don't know, in terms of deep, one could say, uh, in terms of unconscious, though, uh, maybe in psychotherapy, uh, in psychoanalytic terms, um, the person re-experiences with a therapist what they have experienced with their own parents in the past, which has been stored in the hypothalamus or unconscious part of the brain. So when this happens simultaneously with all the logical decisions in a relationship, maybe between the therapist and the, and the client, something happens in the brain, in the different parts of the brain, even in the unconscious and older parts of the brain, the ancient parts of the brain, um, which uh, tells us that maybe, yes, there may be changes because of the activities of the mind, on the neuro neuropsychology and neurophysiology of the brain, I, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, this is an empirical question. I mean, if going through the trauma verbally with the psychotherapist is uh, producing better outcomes than another form, a control or a different form, uh, that is fine. Um, but uh, and in both cases, the brain would be uh, anything you do affected in different ways, and you don't need the magnet <laughs> to go through expensive experiments. They are just as well, and even better, to check the outcome if the person tells you I'm better. And, uh, okay, one more question, last one.
us here because we need to go. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Yeah? Yes. Um, I was wondering, you said that, you said in the book that chimps and orangutans are further apart from chimps and humans genetically, right? Uh, the the uh, gorilla and okay. the chimpanzee are further apart than okay. we and the chimpanzee. At least that's what the biologists say. Okay. In terms of behavior, though, I would place them closer than I would place chimps and humans. Or would you disagree? Well, yeah, yeah, of course. We so don't how have... do you explain this? Yeah. I mean, if we're genetically yeah. similar, how are they more behaviorally similar? But, uh, yeah, the, the, huh? You're saying that yeah, we are similar, and yeah, yet they do. Chimps, right? Yeah. And, but chimps and uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll gorillas say, are further yeah. apart. Okay, okay, well, you need, let's say, an IQ of 80 to go to high school. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, and the gorilla is at uh, 40, and the chimpanzee is at 50. Okay. Uh, so chimpanzee is at uh, closer to us. Uh, in other words, you could have that the gorilla is yet a step further. Uh, but anyway, the, the uh, anatomically, what would happen cognitively, uh, it could, there could be differences. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, anatomically, uh, that is, genetically, we are closer to it. So we are closer, that's what I'm saying, but I feel like we're, we have so many more abilities, language-wise, of course, but in general, I think yeah. that we're further apart behaviorally, and I'm trying to understand, since all the areas are there, what makes the difference? Is it that we have more of something? We yeah, have well, more that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, the, uh, I think, that it's this size that matters, that is the uh, chimpanzee has 600 grams brain measured. Okay. Uh, uh, the human has 1.3 kilos, more than twice. The body size is similar, a bit lighter, but uh, not this huge difference, twice as large. Uh, and you need, uh, that seems to be really the human specialization that supports language and possibly if you look at humans with a low uh, IQ language drops out too. Uh, uh, and, uh, that is, uh, so you're trying IQ language instead. And you're saying that size is very important and that's what gives us the extra Yeah, the synaptic buffer that you need okay. for that. Yeah, that could be also Yeah, could be could be some some things that yeah, but, but you, you, I mean, the language, if you take the written language, you tell me the chimpanzee has capacity for 3,000 words with symbols. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that, uh, they are coming our way. So you're saying we have more of the More of, yeah, I don't think it's a difference. I mean, my dog understood Greek and English. They're just talking now about how they, 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 they set apart the differences between languages. Yeah, and the prosody is certainly understood by dogs. It's one thing to say olive, now to say, to say olive. <laughs> okay. So, science matters. This is what we're saying. I think so. Some science is Thank you. I think it, it's time to close our. Beautiful event. Thank you, Professor Maximus, for all this uh, uh, you have given us, this wonderful uh, lecture, and uh, this interaction with our students. I think uh, it will be something that we will remember, and I would suggest that they read the book, because I've read it, and I think once you start it, you will not stop all the way to the end. So, again, thank you so much. We wish you the best, and thank you for contributing so much to our uh, field and, and psychology and neuroscience. And uh, I think you will have uh, a lot of more to contribute. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.